All right, guys, welcome to Isaiah 50. We have 16 more books to go through, or chapters to go through, and then we'll be done with this thing. Please excuse me, my, the pollen is super high here right now, grass pollens, and so my eyes are really blurry and swelled up, so I'm, I struggle sometimes to read the little letters here on the thing, but uh, it's part of the reason why it's black screen with white lettering, because the white screen glares too much. But we're going to get through it. And this is another chapter about Christ, the servant Israel's hope. Thus says the Lord, where is the certificate of your mother's divorce, whom I have put away? Or which of my creditors is it to whom I have sold you? For your iniquities, iniquities you have sold yourselves. Oh, I'm going to sleep so. For your iniquities you have sold yourselves, and for your transgressions your mother has been put away. Why, when I came, was there no man? Why, when I called, was there none to answer? Hmm, that harkens right back to uh, Genesis. Is my hand shortened at all that it cannot redeem? Or have I no power to deliver? Indeed, with my rebuke, I dry up the sea. I make the rivers a wilderness. Their fish stink because there is no water and die of thirst. I clothe the heavens with blackness, and I make sackcloth their covering. That would be the night sky. The Lord God has given me the tongue of the learned, that I should know how to speak a word in season to him who is weary. He awakens me morning by morning. He awakens my ear to hear as the learned. The Lord God has opened my ear, and I was not rebellious, nor did I turn away. I gave my back to those who struck me, and my cheeks to those who plucked out the beard. I did not hide my face from shame and spitting. We know this is uh, directly relating or referencing the crucifixion. For the Lord God will help me, therefore I will not be disgraced. Therefore I have set my face like a flint, and I know that I will not be ashamed. Even in the midst of troubles, faith still prevails. Verse 8, he is near who justifies me, who will contend with me. Let us stand together. Who is my adversary? Let him come near me. Surely the Lord God will help me. Who is he who will condemn me? Indeed, they will all grow old like a garment. Their moth will eat them up. Who among you fears the Lord? Who obeys the voice of his servant? Who walks in darkness and has no light? Let him trust in the name of the Lord and reply, sorry, and rely upon his God. This is perfectly relating to this morning's video. Psalm 55, 22. Look, verse 11, all you who kindle a fire, who encircle yourselves with sparks, walk in the light of your fire and in the sparks you have kindled. This you shall have for my hand. You shall lie down in torment. And one of those things in verse 10 that the sparks, or not sorry, verse 11, the sparks and, and a circle of them, that's a, a lot of that is referencing. Now there's other references to it, but a lot of that is referencing some of the spell workings that people would do. They would light, make a fire in a circle so the sparks were around them. It was a circle of protection, but that doesn't stop God. They're also relying on themselves. Walk in the light of your fire. So why wouldn't you walk in the light of God, which is the word of God? Because that light of that fire only goes out so far. See, one of the things we have to remember is that when we don't trust in the Lord, a lot of times he will leave prayer unanswered. Sometimes it can be because of a lack of faith, but a lot of times it's because he wants us to see the reality of the situation and just how badly we need him. See, this is what the purpose of the law was, was to show everybody, to get them to the place where like, I can't, I can't fulfill this. I can't fulfill this. He said there was a Savior coming. I need that Savior. I need to be saved. Because I can't do this. It is impossible. I can't be good enough. I can't fulfill these Ten Commandments. I can't. It, 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 the way he described it, I can't. It, I cannot do it. I need a Savior. 
and need salvation. Well, sometimes he'll let this happen with us too. He won't answer the prayer and he'll let us go through this problem. Now, ultimately, he will bring us out on the other side victorious. But we may go through a lot to get to that point. And the whole idea is, remember what I've showed you. Remember who I am. Trust me. Believe. Rely on me. Bring your problems to me. Look to me. But a lot of times we don't do that. Israel, he talks about Israel up here at the top. Israel was like that. And the worse their problems got, the less they looked to their God. But you know, in the Bible, in the Old Testament, every single time they changed. Every single time they stopped and were like, wait a minute, what are we doing? And they turned to God. Every time he stopped everything that was happening and he blessed them. He dealt with them. He provided for them. Every single time. I love what, and I'm reminded of um, uh, Zerubbabel, whenever they were building the second temple, when they came out of their 70-year exile in, um, in uh, Babylon, and they were building it. And it was off. They didn't have the exact location. They had it off to the side of, of quite a few yards. And it was too small. The whole area that they were building on was too small. And it was pretty rough looking. Because they were doing the best they can. They had very few people. Almost everybody else was dead. They had very few people there. Some of them had actually been scattered to other places and had wouldn't come back. So they were working with a minimal amount of materials, crew, tools, all that stuff. They were putting it together. And what did God tell them? Okay, all y'all who were alive and saw the first temple that Solomon built in its glory... You look at this one, is this not like nothing to you compared to that? It, it doesn't just, it's not, doesn't even fit. Now, right away, Zerubbabel's like, wait a minute, I'm trying to do something for you, Lord. But he tells Zerubbabel, he gives him encouragement. He goes, now, all y'all relax, calm down. I'm going to help you. I'm going to bless you. You continue to do what you're doing. I'm going to have your back. I'm going to be there. And then in a future time, I'm going to bring this temple up to a greater glory. What happened? A few hundred years later, here comes Herod. Herod says, I want the Jews to like me. I'm going to make this temple the best temple they've ever seen. And he did. He moved the temple over and centered it, widened it out where it was supposed to be, put the wall, because he had all the paperwork, put the walls the way they were, and that thing was completely overlaid in gold. He did them a real service. Of course, he had reasons for doing that, but look what God did. God brought to him in, and here you go. Now you, now you got a nice temple. Zerubbabel never, never saw it. The people that were alive back then at that time never saw it. But God kept his promise, even though they were dead, even though they didn't see it with their eyes. There are times where in our lives where we don't rely on God. We don't see the result of that, but when we do rely on God, Sometimes we still don't get to see the result of it. And it may not be until after we die that the people we were praying for and people we were hoping for, at that point they change. It may be that the work that we do will see almost no fruit. The things we pray for, the problems that we put before the Lord may see no fruit until after we're gone. Most of these books that you read in the Bible from the prophets, they prayed for the people. They prayed to the Lord. They died or were executed and went on. Almost all of them were killed because the Jews got tired of listening to them and just killed them. They never got to see the fruition of their work. And it was only until thousands of years later that the real fruit came from their work, their books. They didn't see it. They're in heaven. They longed to see those things. The Bible says they wanted to see more about that stuff, more about salvation through grace. 
They wanted to see what their what these writings, what this work they were doing for the Lord was going to bring, and they didn't. They never got the Bible says they never got to see any of that stuff. They didn't receive the promise. It was a future time, and they're going to receive it in the future. Like I talked about this morning, sometimes you pray on things and the Lord acts, and you don't even see the result of it. Just one day you realize the problem doesn't exist anymore, and that's, that's God. Sometimes he lets you see it real time being solved, like literally real time being solved. It's amazing. Sometimes even before you pray for it, he already knows what you have need of and acts before you pray. Sometimes you barely even have time just to say, oh, okay, well, thank you, Father. I didn't even have to pray for this. You already took care of it. Thank you, Father. So you give him praise and thanksgiving. Jesus, being the Son of God, trusted in God. He set the example for us. He trusted in God for everything. Food, clothing, place to sleep, water to drink. And when you read the whole time he walked this earth, every single thing he wanted and needed was provided for him. He showed us the example. Trust in God for everything, even if you have nothing. Jesus said of, him, of his own self, he goes, foxes have dens, but I don't have a place to lay my head. And yet he always had a place to sleep. The Lord always provided him one, provided him a grave, provided him everything, provided him tax money. He told Peter, go down and get a fish. You're going to find two coins in there. Bring them. He provided him everything, literally everything. Provided him a boat. <laughs> Look at Paul. Provided Paul everything he needed, literally. Paul, you're going to Rome. Don't worry about it. Got a free boat ride there. Had a free stay on an island with a bunch of people. Got to preach the whole time and get people saved. And then when he got to Rome, somebody rented him a house and provided everything he needed. His food and all that stuff. And so he chilled out there and pre preached the word. Taught people. Amazing. What a different world it would be and what a different future we would have if Israel would have listened to God back then and turned to him. Nevertheless, our Messiah still came out of them. Our Messiah still came to save them and he will continue to do that because there is a day coming when he will save those who were his. Us and them included. That day's coming. Coming very fast with all the things happening in the world. It's coming really quick. We're watching and waiting for that day. But while we're waiting, even with the things that we see, let us put our trust in him. Rely on him and not look away. And know that no matter what we see in here, he is working. That gives you peace. That brings peace and love and, and security and being locked in and anchored. And it's wonderful. Guys, that was Isaiah 50. Tomorrow will be Isaiah 51, the Lord comforts Zion. We're going to keep going on the path we're going here for the next couple of chapters. Ultimately, Isaiah 53 is going to be the real eye-opener because it has the uh, crucifixion in it. Guys, thank you for watching. See you on the next one.